Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show, most of the time, where we talk about anything that we feel like where the Beatles are concerned, their years together, the solo years, the music, individual songs, what's going on today, whatever we feel like in the moment, we talk about here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this program, known for my syndicated Beatles radio show uh, called Every Little Thing. I've been doing Beatles radio programs ever since March of 1982. So we're coming up on 41 years of doing Beatles shows on the radio. I also co-host another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I have my own YouTube channel where it's all conversations about the Beatles called Ken Michaels Radio. And I'm being joined, as I always am, by my two regulars. First of all, a man who, hey, I just said 41 years with my Beatles radio show. I just learned today, 39 years on the radio at WFUV. Another great milestone. We are dinosaurs, we are here on this show. I guess we are. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> as I put on, as I put on a Facebook post, I said, um, "39 years uh, back when? How did I put it? Uh, I had, I had more hair, and the hair that I had was dark brown, and all of the years of experience are around my waist." <laughs> so, but yeah, it was yesterday. Well, we're recording this on the 27th of February. Yesterday was uh, the 26th. Was 39 years from my first radio show. Right. Congratulations. Uh, it was a Sunday morning at 6 a.m. with Venus and Mars and Rock Show as my opening songs. Mm, nice. See, this man has good taste. He's got class. That's why he's here in the show. Oh, okay. Darren DeVivo. Also, we have Alan Cozen, who's known for having uh, written or co written several books on the Beatles. Most recently, the highly acclaimed especially on every show that I'm on, uh, <laughs> podcast, The McCartney Legacy, right there, volume one, 1969 to 1973. Also the author of Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. Many years he worked at the New York Times in the classical department. So it was great to have him here on this show. Alan Cozen, welcome. Thank you. Um, and... This year, I'll have been doing what I do for 51 years. Is it really? Uh, yeah. I have a quote from, because uh, I because I did stuff before the Times, too. So We always say you're, you're in the ballpark of 40 years, give or take. Well, I was at the mm-hmm. Times for 38, and then I've been out of there since for, since 2015. So, oh. And then before that, I did stuff, too. So anyway, so now it's I, th- I started in 72, so um so 51 wow. and um i ran into a, a quote actually i heard this on on an, an npr interview with um uh salman rushdie who said when you're younger you have to fake wisdom when you're older you have to fake energy <laughs> <laughs> I like that <laughs> very good this is true. This so is- basically folks you're looking at a bunch of fossils here oh, yeah. as we do our show <laughs> But we have great conversations here on the Beatles all the time. And um, our last show, we did a tribute to Yoko Ono, who just celebrated her 90th birthday. And we also have George Harrison's would-be 80th birthday, which just passed. And we had to acknowledge that. Now, here on this show, we've done a lot of specials on each of the Beatles on their birthdays. And we had to come up with a new idea. And so we were struggling a bit. And I thought, well, you know, on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I just did a show and Darren was a part of it, where I asked my guests to name their top five lesser known solo Paul McCartney songs written or co-written by Paul that they feel merit classic status, top tier McCartney songs that are not really well known, more on the obscure side. So I thought, why don't we apply that to George? We'll have each of each of us here on the show name five songs that we feel are not that well known among, you know, casual fans out there. Um, we're not going to pick any big hits like My Sweet Lord or uh, Give Me Love or any of those songs. They have to be more obscure 
and what we feel really deserve to be noticed, need to be acknowledged. That's top tier Harrison, according to us. And I thought we'd also do, and this was really Darren's idea. Um, at first, I thought we'd name our top five George Harrison solo albums. But since just about everybody on the planet would include All Things Must Pass in their top five, we thought, how about your top five without All Things Must Pass? <laughs> so many people would would uh, would list All Things Must Pass as their favorite George Harrison solo album. Many regarded as the best solo Beatle album. Some people think it's one of the greatest albums of all time from anybody. And that includes, I think, all of us. So we're going to do that as well. But um, we, in the last show for the tribute to Yoko, we just had a little bit of news because we wanted to focus mainly on Yoko with having two special guests on the show. And so we have quite a bit of catching up to do uh, as far as news is concerned. We're going to start with, well, birthday greetings sent out to George Harrison. Um, as we said, February 25th would have marked his 80th birthday. Paul McCartney sent the message online, happy would have been to my mate George Harrison. Ringo Starr posted, happy 80, my friend, peace and love. I miss you, man. Simple words, very touching from both of them. Meanwhile, Yoko Ono, as we said, celebrated her 90th birthday on February the 18th. The big news about Yoko is that she has decided to leave Manhattan and the Dakota building that she has made her home for 50 years. And she's relocated to a 600 acre farm near Franklin, New York, where she and John, uh, well, they bought this farm um, back in 1978. The Daily Mail is reporting that Yoko has decided to move there full time and has no plans to return to the seventh floor, nine room Upper West Side apartment she once shared with John. At the same time, there's no suggestion that she plans on selling the apartment. It's a major change of pace for Yoko, who's been forced to step back from public life because of her ill health in recent years. Yoko, in fact, celebrated her 90th birthday with a party at the farm with her longtime friend and publicist, Elliot Mintz, son, Sean, and his girlfriend and musician, Charlotte Kent Mool. Elliot says there was plenty of singing and laughter at the party, which went on throughout the afternoon and lasted until 9 p.m. What do you guys think about that? The one thing I read was that this is actually not news because Yoko may have left the Dakota a couple of years ago. Uh, the pandemic being the reason that oh. she was kind of uh, that she kind of left. And now I'm thinking to myself, I heard somewhere not all that long ago that she's not in the Dakota uh, 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 physically anymore. So this was more of a, I think, I don't know, maybe it just became something that something that was, you know, not common knowledge becoming now common knowledge that she has gone upstate. And this is the farm that I vaguely remember, I believe was the farm they bought in like 76 or something. 78, 78. 78. Cause um, I remember, I remember hearing that, that John's a farmer now and has cows. And I'm like, they invested in Holstein cows. That was Yoko's idea. So, and that's, they kept that, that, that form that was still in, you know, Yoko still owned it. So now she lives there. Yeah. But, um, you know, we so associate her with the Dakota, you know, and she never wanted to leave at all. Despite, you know, well, there were great times she had there and, the big tragedy of what happened right there in front of the building. And she stayed there all these years. So now this is this is a permanent thing for Yoko. Mm -hmm. News coming out last week is that Paul will be guesting on the new Rolling Stones album. With Variety hearing from multiple sources that Paul has laid down a bass part for one of the songs. And it's produced by Andrew Watt, the producer that Paul has been saying he's done some work with recently. There were initial reports that Ringo was also going to be guesting on the album, but that has since been refuted at this point. Recording sessions took place in recent weeks and the album's production is said to be nearing the mixing phase. It will also include tracks with the Stones' late drummer, Charlie Watts, who died in 2021 at the age of 80. Any thoughts about this? This made a lot of headlines. 
especially, you know, at least the initial reports had Ringo on it as well, the two surviving Beatles joining the Rolling Stones. But as far as we know, it, it's supposed to be just one track that Paul plays bass on. Yeah, that makes it fairly insignificant to me. I mean, if, if, if it was Paul and Ringo getting together with the three core Rolling Stones to do a whole album, that would be really interesting. But just guesting on a track, that's nice. It's nice. Yeah. I'll get it. Well, what ended up happening was the tabloids sort of... Um, I know Variety announced it, but I know I saw some other uh, media outlets posting the story and some of them were making it sound like oh they've joined the rolling stones and i'm like no Mm. no you can't no they would that would never happen that would never happen but they and if it did happen it would be mick keith and and uh and ronnie wood would be joining the beatles um (laughs) but no um yeah and then when it did like alan when it came down to it being just paul playing bass okay Nice. I was more interested in it just being the fact that they're finally putting out this album that every once in a while you'd hear about, that they were working on something new. And you would think <clears throat> there was a little bit more of an urgency to finish the thing off for obvious reasons. Right. Just as Charlie Watts. Um, and, it, and, and Blue and Lonesome was really a good record, the blues album they did. Um, it was just... You know, and and they released a single right at when the lockdown began, mm-hmm. a new single that was supposedly something that was also had been recorded during the new album sessions, and then you never heard the words "new album" again. Right. So to me, it was just have. I was glad to hear that there was going to be a new Stones record, and Paul playing bass on one song is just some sprinkles on top. Mm. Well, you know, if he gives you a really good bass line on a Rolling Stones song, to me, it's significant. But what I would really like to see is if there's any kind of film footage of him in the studio with the Stones playing the bass. I think that would be really interesting. Somebody passed a comment, and I don't know if it was just an off-the-cuff comment or somebody knew something. And again, um, nine times out of ten, it's usually stuff that passes my eyes off Facebook. But I think it was a musician, and I don't know if he's in the know or not, claimed that they actually weren't in the studio together. McCartney recorded the bass line in LA and it was flown into the track. Right. I don't know. Makes it less exciting for me, but it's still significant, you know, because of, you know, the association. That's how everything is done these days anyway. So. Mm. All right. Soon it's going to be reduced to Paul spoke to Mick on the phone for five minutes. (laughs) (laughs) On the day the song was recorded and that's all that happened. Hey, Could there, be. There's been things that he's actually had less involvement with that became a record, like you know the the Kanye West thing where he called them up and said, "Am I, am I on this?" And you know, uh-huh. they had a little tape of him playing a guitar riff, and they made it into something um, that the track was built around. So yeah, so talking to Mick on the phone could become a track, you know. <laughs> more involvement that way Hmm. Uh, variety is also reporting that the solo catalog of george harrison has moved to dark horse uh dark horse records uh, via bmg this includes the 12 album catalog from 1968's wonderwall music to 2002's brainwashed plus live in japan let it roll songs by george harrison early takes volume one the Apple Years box set, 1968 to 1975, and the Dark Horse Years, 1976 to 1992. In celebration of George's 80th birthday on February 25th, Dark Horse BMG are releasing his entire catalog on Dolby Atmos surround sound exclusively on Apple Music. But other interesting news regarding the Dark Horse label is that they've been busy acquiring back catalogs while also signing a deal with Yusuf Islam, the artist formerly known as, and still to some as, Cat Stevens. He will have a new album coming out on Dark Horse, and he does an acoustic guitar cover of Here Comes the Sun on the album. Last year, Dark Horse put out a box set of music from Joe Strummer, and they're planning an album from longtime Tom Petty keyboard player Ben Montench. 
And they're also planning a robust campaign to reissue 16 albums from the late Leon Russell. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, talk about expanding the label. You know, I'm going to be curious to see how they handle all of the other artists that were on Dark Horse. Um, and we're going to mention a few of them as we talk about Record Store Day here. But also acquiring past catalogs, you know, really expanding the label. And who knows how far they're going to go with that. And I'm also curious to find out how much of that catalog will be uh, physical releases and how much will be digital. Mm -hmm. We'll have to wait and see about that. As I just mentioned, Record Store Day, it will be happening April 22nd. And we have several releases to talk about in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Wings album Red Rose Speedway. There'll be a limited edition half-speed vinyl master coming out. 5,000 copies are being made. The John Lennon Estate is sharing a 10-inch box set called Give Me Some Truth, originally released on what would have been John's 80th birthday. This compilation, 36 tracks, was a new collection of his most vital and best-loved solo recordings, remixed for the ultimate listening experience. This new exclusive limited edition release and reimagining of Give Me Some Truth is a box set containing nine um, 10-inch EPs. Each EP has four tracks, so that totals 36 songs there. All EPs are pressed on white vinyl, and the numbered boxes include two postcards, a poster, a bumper sticker, and an eight-page booklet. The set is strictly limited to 1,500 copies globally. That's something you both foresee you'll be purchasing? Say what? Is that something you both foresee purchasing? Can't hear you, Ken. It's not coming through clear. <laughs> yeah, right. I think it's possible. Although, if this 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 one would take the cake as being, do we this? Do we need this? Mm -hmm. you know I mean, um, I've sort of felt that the whole "give me some truth" thing was. Didn't we do this already once, not that long ago? Um, yeah. You know, and it was another "give me some truth" compilation. Um, That's but, true. You know. A lot of people love that compilation. They like the remixes. So that was a major I, I, selling point for that. I have a, a friend of mine who actually is a, a record dealer who was one of the, I think, one of the only solid record dealer, very good record dealers that still comes to the Fest for Beatle fans in, in New Jersey, uh, who is going to try to track down a copy for me. No. Okay. Again, another one for the collector. Um, now, say whether you're buying it. No. No, yeah. Alan. Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's 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 getting a little bit ridiculous. Um, I'm really not sure. Um, I'm probably if I go into a record store on record store day and see it right in front of me, I I might very well pick it up and get it. But I, I'm I'm not going to. Um, go to great lengths to find one and uh what did you say the price was i didn't say the price i don't know no, the I, price i think it's pretty i've heard of it from a few places it's a little nutty mm -hmm. the price yeah mm -hmm. whatever, yeah whatever you want to say feel defined nutty as you know i i kind of think at my uh since we were we were talking about our uh, collective old ages at my old age I, I i might have to start becoming responsible i mean responsible i don't even know what that is but why start now <laughs> why start now yeah i know it's, well that's that's usually that's usually the argument i get to right before i actually take the credit card out uh, so and i of course happen to be a practical beatles fan hmm. which some would say would be boring <laughs> in that regard but um also there are two releases from ringo both for his 1981 album, Stop and Smell the Roses, a two LP set, 2,500 copies being made, and a one LP version for which only 500 are being made. Oh. Those are from Culture Factory USA. The two LP set, I'm figuring, has got to be with the bonus tracks that were on the CD that came out in 1994. The one LP version wouldn't have that. Mm. I believe it's also coming out on CD, too. Is it? 
Okay, I only saw oh, vinyl. I believe so. For this, it's like okay. they did with Bad Boy, not Bad Boy, Old Wave. Uh huh. It came out on CD and vinyl. Okay. It's just, I mean, it's still how many? What is it? It's in April. So right, April twenty second. Also, the Blind Man soundtrack will be available on Record Store Day with music written and arranged by Stelvio Cipriani. 1,000 copies will be made of that. That was on Abco Records originally. Didn't have Ringo's song, Blind Man, on there. But for people that have to have everything, that's coming out. Now, since we mentioned Dark Horse Records, they will have Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros Streetcar album available with... How do they come up with this number? 1,760 copies made. And also an album originally on Dark Horse in 1975 by The Stair Steps. Um, that was their last album. They were originally the five Stair Steps, you remember, with Ooh Child as a hit. The Stair yeah. Steps album called Second Resurrection. Um, as I said, also on Dark Horse, 1,410 copies made for that. All right, so plenty there to sink your teeth into, depending upon, you know, how deep into the catalog you want to go. Uh, March 15th, there'll be a big concert honoring Paul McCartney at Carnegie Hall with various artists all performing his songs. Peter Asher will be there. Denny Lane is scheduled to appear, and I just saw him in concert. He was there alone on stage, an acoustic show, and he announced that he'll be there performing with Christopher Cross, Mull of Kintyre. And he also will be with Nancy Wilson of Heart uh, to perform Band on the Run. Also appearing will be Natalie Merchant, Betty Lavette, Lyle Lovett, Bruce Hornsby, Graham Nash, Cactus Blossoms, and others. There's no word as to whether or not Paul will show up for this. They usually don't in these. These... Uh... This is a Michael Dorff production. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Dorff is the guy who owns City Winery. Um, the city, I guess it's a chain now, the City Winery franchise chain. Right. I don't think, and I, because FUV has always been involved in these tribute concerts at Carnegie Hall. Um, and I don't recall ever hearing that the person being honored is part of them. I could be completely wrong because I don't remember anything anymore. But, um, that's what this McCartney show is. Hmm. Well, you never know. I mean, some of his friends are there, like Peter Asher and, and uh, Danny Lane. Mm -hmm. um, the Beatles recording of Yellow Submarine was just used in a TV commercial for Airbnb, and it was seen during the Super Bowl, so I'm told. This is part of a campaign in which photographers show pictures of their trips on Airbnb with family and friends. And this particular trip shows a crew playing games, sleeping in the captain's quarters and finding the proverbial sea of green. Just significant because it's the Beatles recording that's being used in the commercial. Speaking of the Super Bowl, this goes to show how we have to catch up on all this news. Paul was there with his wife, Nancy, having a great time dancing while on the Jumbotron. Uh, and Paul, as you know, has been very visible in recent years, attending lots of sporting events. Last March, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland featured a new exhibit in celebration of the Beatles documentary directed by Peter Jackson, Get Back, called The Beatles, Get Back to Let It Be. It displayed original instruments, clothing, and handwritten lyrics used by the Beatles and seen in the film. We did a whole show on this. Um, the Rock Hall just announced that they are extending the exhibit to go throughout 2023. So if you haven't had the opportunity to see it, you now have more of a chance to do so. Rolling Stone magazine just came up with a list of their top 50 genuinely horrible albums by brilliant artists. And three solo Beatle albums made the list. At number 30 was Paul's Give My Regards to Broad Street. Number 19 is George's Gone Trapo. And at number seven, I'm sorry, Alan, Unfinished Music Number One, Two Virgins by John and Yoko. And in the uh, and the online article, which they, they may have corrected it by now, but when they first started, when they first published it, at least online, they had a cover. They have, the cover that art was Life with the Lions that they showed. 
Shows how much they know. It was a ridiculous list. It was just, it was ridiculous. Okay. Uh, a few more things. Brian Ray of Paul McCartney's band has been keeping active. Just recently releasing a new single called On My Way to You. And you can hear me and Brian talk about the song and the new video for it on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. But on top of that, he has a new single with his band, The Bayonets. And that's his collaboration with Oliver Lieber, the son of Jerry Lieber of Lieber and Stoller fame. Their new song is called Argentina, Another Good Rocker. We're going to close uh, with three major passings to talk about since, well, the show before our tribute to Yoko. We have to mention the passing of Burt Bacharach, who was definitely one of the greatest songwriters we've ever had, certainly in my opinion. Um, the Beatles covered one of his songs, and that being Baby It's You. And also in the Beatles camp of uh, artists managed by Brian Epstein and produced by George Martin, Scylla Black recorded Anyone Who Had a Heart and Alfie and had number one singles in the UK with those two songs, both Burt Bacharach, Hal David songs. And if you caught um, that recent documentary, If These Walls Could Sing, you did see actual footage in the studio of Scylla Black with Burt Bacharach and George Martin in the studio working on Alfie. And in addition to that, Billy J. Kramer recorded Trains and Boats and Planes, another Burt Bacharach, Hal David song. And I know that uh, Burt really uh, enjoyed Billy's treatment of that song. Uh, Paul McCartney posted on his Twitter account a photo of himself with Bacharach and Jimmy Buffett sharing these words dear Burt Bacharach has passed away his songs were an inspiration to people like me I met him on a couple of occasions and he was a very kind and talented man who will be missed by us all his songs were distinctive and different from many others in the 60s and 70s and in a follow-up tweet McCartney said when we met not too long ago he reminded me that he had been the musical for, uh, director for Marlena Dietrich when the Beatles shared the bill with her at the Prince of Wales Theater for the Royal Variety performance. He was a lovely man. Nancy and I send lots of love to his family. Just thought uh, we really should say a few words about Burt Bacharach. Um, after he passed away, I spent you know a decent amount of time on YouTube watching a lot of interviews with Burt. And I certainly see a parallel there between Burt and the Beatles because Burt was told um, when he was writing songs at times that, you know, the people who were advising him when it came to songwriting, that he really shouldn't go in the directions that he wanted to, because that's not what was normally done in terms of music theory. But Burt Bacharach did everything kind of like what he heard in his ear and what worked for him. And the Beatles are very much the same way. Mm -hmm. The Beatles broke, you know, a lot of norms in the music industry and they did what they felt was right in their own ears and in their head and um i know that paul in particular was asked would you ever consider you know studying music theory because if you did that that could make you an even greater songwriter than you already are if you really understand you know composition as 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 it's taught um and paul didn't want to do that for the very same reason because he would feel like he would be restricted and he couldn't go in certain directions with his music. He wanted to do what, what felt right, like I said, in his ears, what sounded right, you know, not only in terms of music composition, but also in, in terms of production. Um, you know, just like the Beatles broke so much ground as songwriters and as recording artists, you listen to the music of Burt Bacharach and, you know, what he did in terms of songwriting composition was was very unique. Um, he had a background in both jazz and in classical music. There were plenty of times when he changed time signatures throughout the song, which was very unusual to do. The Beatles did the same thing, which was unusual in pop music and in rock music. And so I do see a you know a strong similarity there in the fact that you know the Beatles were so groundbreaking in so many ways. And so was Burt Bacharach, especially when it came to song composition. I don't know if any of you want to comment about that. 
I hate that line of reasoning about not wanting to learn theory because you'll be restricted. Knowing the rules <laughs> doesn't mean you have to keep to the rules. You know, that's the, that's it. Just doesn't that makes no sense to me whatsoever. Nor does nor does Paul's other reason for not wanting to do it because he's afraid he's going to subconsciously plagiarize something if he knows if he knows the rules. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I know. Well, but how do you really feel, Alan? You know, I always say how I really feel. <laughs> it's part of my charm. Well, you know, then you can reason it's worked for him all these years. Oh, it's worked for him all these years. But, you know, um, I don't think it would have done him any harm to learn it. You know, he thinks it might have done him some harm. I don't know. I, you know, the thing about rules is you can always ignore rules. But sometimes knowing rules shows you interesting stuff you can do because you haven't thought about it because you haven't learned the rules. So um, and 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 even interesting stuff you can do because it's breaking the rules. You know, every composer out there, every classical composer who learned all the rules, all the great ones broke rules, broke rules mm -hmm. by the bucket load. And that's why they became that's why they were great. Because, you know, they knew what the rules were and they knew when and why they can get around them or just ignore them or do something else. Um, you know, I don't think he's I, I, I'm, I'm not saying necessarily that Paul would have been better if he had known the rules. I, I'm right. just saying it wouldn't have hurt him, you know, and and it's just a line just the line of reasoning drives me crazy um if he doesn't want to if he didn't want to do it just okay i don't want to do it i just don't want to that's that's fine that's good enough reason but to give the reason that you would feel restricted don't don't do it don't say that <laughs> it's stupid okay you made a valid point there mm. but i'm just talking about the similarities there mm. you know based on what i heard Bert Bacharach say especially when we're starting out writing songs. Right. You know, and, I'd be surprised uh, if Burt Bacharach, I mean, Burt Bacharach really didn't know that stuff. I mean, I'm sure he could, could write. Uh, he probably know. did know it. Yeah. But then there would be, there'd be someone, a teacher of his who would say, you're really not supposed to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work when you're in this key, you can't use this other chord. It doesn't work, you know, or something like that. But yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, that, and he ignored them, even, yeah. you know, even knowing the rules. So you see, mm. it can be done. <laughs> and he developed a style that was so much his own. Mm. I mean, I could pick out without being told the Burt Bacharach song based on the melody. Mm -hmm. You know. And also, like I said, time signature changes, which make a huge difference. Um, another legend passed away in Raquel Welch last week apart from her many film roles she starred in the magic christian oh. with ringo and peter sellers where she played the villainous princess of the whip in the film she's dressed in an armored leather bikini with a headdress leather cuffs and bull whip leaving nothing to the imagination on board the ship the magic christian she struts around a raised walkway wielding a whip and there were pictures of Alan wearing that. I saw <laughs> somewhere. I forget where I saw those. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have seen them. They were in a fantastic a... voyage. I was chasing her around. In... <laughs> he was an understudy mm -hmm. for the film. Yeah. So uh, Raquel died after a brief illness. She was 82. And also we have learned of the passing of R&B artist Chuck Jackson. Chuck was the original artist behind the song. I keep forgetting which Ringo covered on his Old Wave album. And he's best known for the hit Any Day Now, which was covered by a lot of artists like Elvis Presley and Ronnie Millsap. Any Day Now was, in fact, co-written by Burt Bacharach. Uh -huh. um, now, there is a story, thanks to our good friend Michael Lynch, who composed our theme. We should always give him a lot of credit here, or a music theme. He says when the Yardbirds were starting out, after their first two singles, they were getting nowhere and they needed a major hit. And their manager, Giorgio Gamelski, saw John in a club. Michael said he wasn't sure it might have been the ad lib. Giorgio uh, knew that John and Paul had given the Rolling Stones a song with I Want to Be Your Man. 
which helped to break them. And he didn't have the nerve to flat out ask John for a song for them. But he did say that the band really needed a new song. And a week later, they both met at the same club. And John said to him, I've got a song for you. And Giorgio thought, yes, he took the bait. And John took out a 45 of Chuck Jackson's song, The Breaking Point. That was the song that he recommended that the Yardbirds cover. <laughs> and Chuck Jackson died on February the 16th, and he was 85. All right. We also send out happy birthday wishes to Elliot Mintz, who uh, on February the 16th celebrated his 78th birthday. Happy oh. birthday to you, Elliot. Happy birthday, Elliot. All right. Our show this time is a tribute to George Harrison. And like I said at the beginning of the show, I thought that what we would do is come up with a list of five songs from George Harrison's solo career that are lesser known songs in George's catalog that he wrote or co-wrote. They have to be original that we feel deserve classic status that are really more on the lesser known obscure side. Can't uh, come up with major hits from George. So uh, Darren and Alan and myself will list our top five in this category. Why don't we start with Alan? As usual, I came up with way more than five. So if some of these aren't obscure enough for you, I'll just pick another one. Um, <laughs> the first one is Deep Blue. Is that obscure enough? It's a B yes. side. With, uh -huh. It was the B side of Bangladesh. And um, if I remember correctly, the story was that George wrote it when his mother was dying. And, um, you know, it's basically a blues, but it's a George blues. Um by which I mean, there is, uh, you know, listening to a lot of stuff um, since we decided to do this, it was just trying to find things because, I, you know, sometimes with someone like George, it's hard to find things that you think are obscure because you know them pretty well, hmm. uh, even if they weren't hits, you know. Um, and listening to a lot of George's songs, I mean, one thing really struck me is that um, he moves very easily and quickly and without any particular kind of preparation in between major and minor modes all the time. And that is a, a, a characteristic of, of George's melodic style. And mm. that's the kind of thing that, you know, if someone were to play you a completely unreleased George song um, that you would never heard, you would probably have like a 90% chance of guessing that it was by George, just because a George melody is, you know, if you think of all the George melodies, you know, they, they almost all do it, you know? Um, and in fact, when, um, when we were working on volume one of this thing um, and Denny Lane came, had no words, uh, which Paul collaborated with him on, but Denny Lane's melody for that song is very Georgie. He does the, the, the major minor mm. thing too. Um, you know, it's, you'll have something in a major key and then yet there'll be a minor turn that, you know, just gives it a little bit of sadness, but it's not necessarily a sad song. George has it all the time and deep blue, you know, well, deep blue was a semi sad song seeing as it's, you know, it's supposed to be, it's based on a blues, but, um, and it's also, you know, a nice acoustic track basically. And, um, yeah, it was on the flip side of the Bangladesh single, which I got when it came out and, and used to play both sides just as much as each other. Um, uh, it never ended up on an album except for uh, Greatest Hits, the, the, the first George Harrison Greatest Hits album that Capitol cobbled together with a lot of Beatles songs and a few George mm -hmm. Harrison solo songs. And then I think it was, it, it's sure it's been thrown on to as a bonus track onto something. Don't know what um do you remember i think it's a bonus track on living in the material world yeah it could be yeah. the thing about george's bonus tracks is they often are on albums that the the track isn't particularly associated with i, I can't figure out why they do these things sometimes and i was hoping when you were talking about those albums being reissued by Dark Horse, that they would reconsider a lot of these and put the songs the bonus tracks where they should logically go hmm. but anyway deep blue i really like deep blue uh, uh, miss o miss odell was on uh 
you know, that was the B side of Give Me Love. And mm -hmm. that was a bonus track on Living in the Material World. So that belonged there. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the next one is, uh, it's sort of out of order chronologically, but um, it is he, Jai ah. Shri Krishna from Dark Horse. Um, I like this. So there's sort of a dobro sound in it. So it's a little different from George's normal slide sound. And um, it's, you know, a, a very attractive melody. And, uh, you know, it's one of his his Krishna songs, obviously. Um, you know, a lot of people are put off by that. I'm not put off by that. I find it kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, in a way, the 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 Jai Shri Krishna part, which is the beginning of the song, is sort of like a chant. And I, I don't know um, Hindu music well enough to know whether that's an actual traditional chant that he brought into it. Um, or whether it's totally his, but in any case, it's it's just a very attractive song. And uh, so, if you haven't heard that or haven't focused on that, I, I recommend that. Hmm. Um, third one, "Woman, Don't You Cry for Me," um, but I'm recommending the slide acoustic slide guitar version from "All Things Must Pass" because. I like it much better than the fully produced band version that he did later on. What was it? 33 and a third. Yep. Um, you know, it's a good song and the slide version just to me, it, it, it's, it's perfect for that song uh, far more than the, the sort of electric band version was. So there's that um, to outtakes like that count once they've been official. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. He, okay. You know, he, he played slide on the, on the, the band version on 33 and a third i know but a lot I of slide like on there that version as much you know I, I like this this acoustic version is very tight very you know compact and and uh you know i kind of like the the feeling of an acoustic blues seems to me to really suit that song perfectly you know okay so uh is soft hearted hannah obscure enough yes okay very <laughs> Okay, well, so that's on the George Harrison album, and it's, I know I've, I've mentioned it before, and maybe when we did a, uh, when we did that, uh, you know, the Red and the Blue album, we did the Green album, I think I might uh -huh. have, uh, you know, it's about, um, you know, magic mushrooms, uh -huh. um, and particularly, apparently, ones that you can get in Hawaii. There's, a, a, you know, some references to some places in Hawaii in there. But if you listen to the track, I mean, it's a very sort of psychedelic experience, um, uh, you know, the lyrics and, uh, you know, and, and also at the very end, I'm not entirely sure what happens at the end of the song there. It sounds to me like they're Vera speeding it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Because the other alternative is that he's just playing completely out of tune. And I don't think he would put that out if that's what he was doing. So the first, first time I was listening to it this morning and I was thinking, okay, so, so it's Vera speed at the end. And then I kept, you know, turning up the volume and listening to it again and, you know, began not hearing the speed change as much as the wrong notes, you know? So um, anyway, it's because of the sort of psychedelicness of the track. Obviously that's what he has in mind for that ending and it's during the fade out. So it's very easy to miss. And so that is four. I still remember when that came out, when George Harrison was first released, mm -hmm. getting the album and the first handful of times I played it, going running to my turntable to see what on earth was wrong <laughs> yep. because the pitch with the speed was all distorted and something was wrong with my turntable every time until I remembered this is the song that it gets a little weird at the end and the crowd, the background noises and the crowd mm -hmm. partying noises always <laughs> cracked me up and I don't know why because at one point it's something like somebody's starting to talk like this yeah. For no particular reason, and just uh, that always cracked me up. That that song, mm. and musically, it's a little bit to me. It's 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 
it it has some ties to deep blue in a way you know it's yeah. that it's that same kind of of, of thing um, there's something about there's there are these wide intervals that george sings and they're very i think they might be the same intervals but it, it makes you know both songs a bit similar in that regard yeah melodically yeah you know so and my fifth one is that which i have lost Ooh. And that is on somewhere in England. And, you know, that has this at the, the very beginning and then elsewhere in the song, it comes back. It has this kind of country sound. Um, tuba and, too. Hmm? I think there's tuba in there too. Could be. I'm not sure about that. I don't know. Um, what struck me more was the sort of... Uh, you know, country folk kind of thing. And then it slid into the George Harrison kind of melody that that I mentioned, and then back to the country thing. Um, it's an interesting track. And um, I know I've overlooked it, you know, lots of times that I've played that album. And, um, you know, well, fortunately, we're looking for obscure stuff. That one um, seemed to fit. Well, wow, very nice. Really impressed with It Is He in your list. I've always loved that. Yeah. I love that song. Mm -hmm. You know, I love those songs that are, you know, mantra esque, you yeah. know, and uh, repeating it over and over again. And I love the flutes and that. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that could have been a single, you know, it, it, it's possible that, uh, you know, he was, would have been talked out of it because of, you know, the Krishna aspect of it. But, you know, but uh, My Sweet Lord was a number one hit. My Sweet Lord was, yes, that's true. It's true. But I but I, I know that he got a lot of pushback, maybe not from Capitol, but from critics and from, you mm. know, some listeners and uh, and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, his 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 record career is very strange. You know, he seems to have, uh, you know, around the time of Gontrapo, you know, completely lost interest because of whatever pushback he got, whatever lack of interest from record companies he got. You mm -hmm. know, um, I kind of think that if he had been handled a bit better as a solo artist, um, we would have had a lot more from him. And uh, yeah. so that's a pity. Yeah. Anyway. Interesting. Very interesting. But yet at the same time, he had a bad reaction to the 74 tour. It would have been nice if he kept on touring every few years. And that would have really probably helped his album sales a bit, I would think. Yeah. Um, but because he didn't, he decided not to tour again until the tour of Japan, yeah. you know. But then the tour of Japan went really well. So, you know, I was sort of hoping that that would get him to sort of reconsider the the tour idea, you know maybe do some more we all were hoping that yeah mm. okay darren your yes. top five top five songs this was not easy this was very hard because when i put my list together it was all all the songs i was picking was coming from one or two albums mm. and i was trying to spread out spread things out a bit more and then decided just to go with my gut and pick these these deep cuts that were favorites of mine George doesn't have a lot of rare stuff, which Alan alluded to. You know, you've only got a few B-sides that didn't make their way onto albums. Uh, and even those, in a way, in the case of Deep Blue and Miss Odell especially, they've gotten a little mileage in recent years. Um, you know, you get those two new songs that were on the Best of Dark Horse compilation. But still, I mean, there's not a lot of rare Harrison stuff this year, you're going into albums to pick what we all individually interpret as deep cuts. Yep. And I think that I actually picked maybe one that may have gotten a bit of airplay at the time. But you, as you'll see, these are pretty much, I think, all centered on two albums. Uh, when I did the list, I eliminated All Things Must Pass because that really tips the scales mm -hmm. because there's so many songs, 18 of his songs, on all things must pass. And you can make the argument that, you know, if somebody's putting a list together, it's almost impossible to not include several of them in a list like right. this, at least one of them in a list like this. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm going to take the all things must pass out of the equation. It doesn't need any more 
you know, praise coming from me. Uh, it's it's had it all. It'll keep getting it. Uh, and then I started putting the songs together. I'm like, holy smokes, it's all really three albums. So let me go with what I have. I have a few runners up that dropped out of the top five, but the main ones in no particular order. Um, starting off with a song that I used to think was a single. I remember you and I uh, in a past show, Ken, have talked about how on in New York City, WPLJ's treatment of the Wings at the Speed of Sound album, playing so many songs from that album. They probably did it with others as well, I'm sure. Clouded hmm. what was actually a, a hit single to someone who didn't like wasn't up on singles and hits and whatnot. Right. So I used to think that this was a hit song from back in the day. Beautiful girl from 33 and a third. Hmm. Beautiful Never. girl. Beautiful Girl has number one hit written all over it and why it was never put out as a single, I never understood. And so as not to be repetitive, I left Don't Let Me Wait Too Long off my list because I know I've picked it in the past for stuff. Hmm. And that's another one that I think was an almost single but got canceled. Right. It right. Did. So, all right. For that reason, I picked Beautiful Girl and passed over Don't Let Me Wait Too Long. But Beautiful Girl's definitely in my top five, as is a song that I've always loved, Pure Smokey. Mm -hmm. His tribute to Smokey Robinson and a melody that he actually ripped off from himself mm -hmm. because on the album before 33 and a Third, that melody appears on Extra Texture, read all about it, and I can never remember which song. Are you talking about Ooh Baby? I think which that's... was also a tribute to Smokey. Yeah, but there's very similar similarities in the melodies to the point where it sounds like they're the same song, just kind of tweaked and with different lyrics. But I, I, Extra Texture was an album I got familiar with years later. I believe 33 and the Third was my first George Harrison album that I got when it was the current release. Uh, and I adore that album. And so Pure Smokey was a tune I always loved. Something about that kind of like American-ish, um, light jazz feel that he dabbled in mm -hmm. uh, in the mid to late 70s, I always liked. Uh, probably because of the musicians he was working with, Tom Scott and, right. and those guys kind of brought LA that, Express. Laid that, said that just kind of laid that vibe on, on uh, that stuff that he was doing in the mid to late 70s. And I always liked that vibe, that sound. So Pure Smokey um, is my second pick. And I'll put my one of my honorable mentions in here so as not to pick two similar songs from the same album. Learning How to Love You was another one that I would have picked. But mm -hmm. I went, all right, just go with one of them. And I went with Pure Smokey. Um, okay, this is off George Harrison, If You Believe. Mm-hmm which was another deep cut that I never understood why that never came out as a single. And I seem to remember getting a little, so somebody, I, I, I was familiar with it from having heard it on the radio a little bit, I guess, when George Harrison was first released. That definitely had hit record on, on yeah. potential as far as I'm concerned. And this could be like Alan was alluding to before. It was coming at a point when the record companies were, well, in this case, Warner Brothers was sort of, you know, not really paying a lot of attention to what George was doing because they blew it, I think, on that one, not putting that out as a single, hmm. which would have made it, what, probably would have been the follow-up to... Blow well, Away? But no, your um, Love Comes to Everyone was the next single. Which Maybe. I also think had potential as a single. Probably, you know, if you believe, I think would have been a stronger single, yeah. in my in my opinion. So it's so so let me make sure I'm getting the one was beautiful girl, pure smoky, three if you believe. Okay. Um everyone loves not everyone, a lot of people love to just kind of poo-poo Gontrapo. Um and while Gontrapo has a couple of songs on there, maybe you might not agree which ones, there's a couple maybe to weigh it down a bit. It's a very light album, so it is very easy to Forget it if you're a passive fan. Hmm. Uh, it doesn't have any real heavy moments like All Things Must Pass has. But Mystical One uh, was another little George gem 
uh, that he was so good at those songs. Every album's got those very light, easy, flowing, easy. I hate to use this phrase, yacht rock vibe, man. <laughs> uh, you know, that um, like I could see myself sitting on a yacht, one of my yachts that I own. Uh, on a on a on a on a nice warm day, listening to Gontrapa and George Harrison and somewhere in England those albums. So mystical one's my fourth pick, and my fifth one is Dream Away uh, from the same album mm -hmm. from Gontrapa. Uh, and by doing that, I passed over Your Love Is Forever, and I explained why. No, no, I didn't. I passed over Your Love Is Forever just because I had to pick five, and and learning how to love you. That's the one I explained because it was. Kind of like, all right, go with Pure Smokey as your jazzy kind of jazz light ballad from 33 and a third. Mm. And um, and at the last sound we will mention I had on, scribbled on the side was That Is All from Living in the Material World. Um, but something had to get pushed off. So, And then I looked and I'm like, oh, look, I concentrated on three albums here. But I mean... 33 and a third and George Harrison, two albums I love so much. It was almost impossible for them not to. I would challenge yeah. Dream Away as, as, as being obscure since he used it in Time Bandits. It was in a movie. So um, so you, so one of your runners up can move up to. OK. Uh, All right. If I had to move one in, take Dream Away out, uh, I would. Uh, you know what? I'd move uh, Learning How to Love You. Um, and it was funny. And maybe one of you could like. Um, shed light on this i remember we were talking about burt backrack early on in the show yeah i grew up hearing a lot of burt backrack material and burt backrack ish material that whole a and m thing mm -hmm. a &M records because my dad had um i know he had the uh make it easy on yourself album from burt backrack and reach out i think but he also had Sergio Mendez and Bruce, Brazil 66 albums and Herb Alpert and Tijuana Brass albums. And mm -hmm. those albums always had, if it wasn't a Burt Backrack song, it sure as had sounded like one on, on those two artists' albums. Right. So uh, Dark Horse Records initially was a subsidiary of A&M, but ended up George got sued because he didn't deliver 33 and a third on time. So when 33 and a third did come out, Your Love is Forever was dedicated to Herbie Albert, something like that in the liner notes. I always wondered if that was going to be a song dedicated to Herb Albert seriously, or was like a little bit of a kind of like a Olive Branch wise ass move on George's part <laughs> because he had just been sued by Herb Albert's company. Hmm. You know, I don't know, I don't but know. that's a little thread there. And hmm. learning how to love you was 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 dedicated to Herb Albert this coming months after A and M Records sued George, and he took Dark Horse over to Warner Brothers. But um, so those are my songs. Those okay. are my George songs. I got to learn to not put you on before me, Darren, because <laughs> <laughs> you know our tastes are very much alike. I mean, there's so many songs you mentioned that were more honorable mentions. That would be on my list. But, uh, you know, as someone who has always said I'm a real sucker for a great love song, um, my number one pick is That Is All, because That Is All is a song that, ironically, if you read I Me Mine, George's book, he doesn't make a big deal about the song. You know, the lyrics and the melody came to him and that was all. No big deal. <laughs> you know, It's a tremendous melody. The lyrics are very simple, but very effective. That is all I want to say. Our love can save the day. Um, it's it's really a beautiful melody. Great slide guitar part in the song. It is kind of his something in his solo career. And I always thought it was such a tremendous crime that it wasn't a hit record or it didn't get the exposure that it deserved to be. Harry Nilsson covered the song. Andy Williams covered the song, yeah. you know, and as I've always said, if somebody, you know, of that caliber, an Andy Williams, a Tony Bennett, a Frank Sinatra, if they recognize a song like that, there's got to be something to it. I it really like should that. be a standard. What's that? I always like the ending of the song because it leaves you hanging the way it just kind of right. quietly just drops and it's like it 
turn the record over, play it again. You've got to hear the album again. Right. It kind of leaves you like hanging there. That those final quiet notes. It's kind of suspended. So uh, yeah, I think that is all as a masterpiece, and it really is among you know. I think it's one of the greatest love songs ever written by anybody. And I really wish the song would be recognized. Um, likewise, I would say the same thing about Your Love is Forever, which, um, you know, George is not the least bit um, afraid of having his songs be very slow. And such is the case with Your Love is Forever. And again, exquisite melody, incredible slide guitar work. And just like the George Harrison album and Gon Trapo give you that tropical feel like you're on an island like hawaii or whatever you feel like you know you can feel the breezes going as you're hearing this song and the palm trees are are swaying um it's simply a, a stunning a gorgeous song and between that and and dark sweet lady back to back two great love songs on the george harrison album um you know that's george at the top of his game when it comes to love songs right there I wasn't quite sure if I should put this in because at the time when Cloud Nine came out, this song got a ton of airplay on rock radio, and that's Devil's Radio. Now, Devil's Radio was not chosen as a single. It was an album cut, but like I said, rock radio played it a lot. I never hear it anymore on the radio, on rock stations. If you're lucky, you'll hear it Got My Mind Set On You, and you'll hear When We Was Fab. You know, one radio station that I listen to on Long Island um, actually plays This Is Love once in a while. Um, but I don't hear Devil's Radio anymore on the radio. And I think it was a solid rocker with great guitar work from Eric Clapton on there. And, you know, it should be well known amongst George's rockers. I always think you know. that was a single. Devil. I think it was an album cut, and I know radio stations got a 12-inch at the time okay. as an it emphasis cut. It was a promo. Yeah. But it was never a commercial single. Mm -hmm. He just had Got My Mind Set On You, When It Was Fab, and This Is Love as singles. Um, yeah, but Devil's Radio, I think, is a solid rocker and really should be a standout amongst, you know, George's entire solo catalog. You know, one of the, the few criticisms I could ever make about George is that I wish he rocked a bit more uh, on his solo albums. But uh, you listen to Cloud Nine, you got Devil's Radio, you got Wreck of the Hesperus, you know, you got Fish on the Sand, which really has more of a country and Western feel to it, country and Western and rock. Um, that you know, was a but... bit of also why I chose um, that which I have lost. It's it's faster than most of his things, you know. Like mm. he was saying that he has no problem doing slow things, which he he does a lot. But but that one really sort of is a, a really brisk. It's another reason that I that I had chosen that. And so you, you're you're saying that reminded me of another thing I liked about it, right? I'm kind of surprised you didn't put blood from a clone in there, considering your your comments about how you. You like how George was sticking it to the record company on that yeah. on that track. Um, I have to put The Light That Has Lighted the World, which I think is a, an incredible song because I think it's a very personal song of George's. And I ironically, if you if you read what he said about about the song in his I Me Mind book, originally he wrote it for Scylla Black to record because it was it was more to do with um, a local artist suddenly becoming big and not being the same person that she was uh, moving from Liverpool. Now she's in London. She's a major star. And but I didn't know all that history when Living in the Material World came out and I heard that song. And I thought it perfectly suited George's story about someone who, you know, has his own newer identity that he's on this spiritual journey. He's not the same person that he was. Don't think of him in this limited role as Beatle George. And um, that he appreciates the people uh, that can see that this is his new life and this is what matters to him. And so that particular song, as well as Who Can See It, where there's a parallel and the message there, um, I think are absolutely brilliant. Um, 
and I especially love Nicky Hopkins piano in there, which is simple, but just right. Nicky had the right touch for everything that he did. Um, and I also had to put the answers at the end in there. I do like when George does his uh, prophetic stuff and preaches to people. Uh, I do love that side of George and him telling you not to be judgmental of other people, which is what that whole song is about. It's a great melody. It's a great chorus in there at the end. I kind of wish that he did more lead guitar work. He has a very short lead guitar solo towards the end there at the answers at the end. But I've always rated that as being, you know, one of the songs that you have to include whenever you do a best of George Harrison that wasn't a single. Um, and the lyrics also come from sayings from Sir Frankie Crisp, you know, that were on the grounds there at his estate uh, in Henley. But um, I didn't want to do honorable mentions because, you know, I'd be here all day. But those are my five. That is all. Your love is forever. Devil's radio. The light that has lighted the world and the answers at the end. Believe me, I can come up with many more. <laughs> but I wanted to limit it to just five. All right. All right. So let's do the second part of our tribute here to George and list our top five solo albums from George other than All Things Must Pass. And as I said earlier, and Darren came up with this idea in a way because I don't know anybody that wouldn't include All Things Must Pass somewhere in their top five. And for a lot of people, it'll be number one. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine anyone, not just because the songs are so good, on all things must pass but it's two albums <laughs> of great material so um it's it's hard to pass up all things must pass it was when george really exploded came into his own he had built up all these songs over the last few years when he released them and most important of all the songs are really powerful so if you could pick your top five with any of george's solo albums besides all things must pass. What would they be? All right. Um, this time we'll start with Darren. Alrighty. This is easy because I'm always tempted to pick this ahead of All Things Must Pass. Uh, anyway, and that's 33 and a third. That's your favorite of all yep. Harrison albums? Yep. Oh, okay. And in fact, and people have told me I'm an idiot. Well, they tell me I'm an idiot often for a bunch of different reasons, but. You know, I always look at All Things Must Pass as a as a complete album, three record set, 18 songs, and jams. The jams are part of the album. To me, it weighs down All Things Must Pass a little. Because what the me, Apple Jam does, you mean? Yeah. It it's a part of the album. I so consider I, it a bonus. Alan a bonus part. <laughs> Should I call him an idiot now? Or wait <laughs> It seems um, a little unfair, Darren. What? It seems a little unfair because it, it is a bonus disc, as Ken says. And I I, I think, if, I mean, I kind of agree with you that it's part of the album, but that's mainly because I like them. Mm -hmm. If I didn't, well, then, I would ignore them. Pound for pound, 33 and a third packs. Okay. You know, doesn't have any any, like, you know, all right, I'll just stop and say, all right, after All Things Must Pass, my favorite George Harrison album is 33 and a third. That was my first one, okay. if I remember correctly, as I mentioned before. And that would be followed very closely by Living in the Material World, um, uh, an album I remember when I got it as a birthday gift a few years after it had been initially released. But I got it. Close enough to the mid seventies that it was an it was I got an original Apple copy. Um, it took it took some listens because it's a very introspective album and at times it's a very it's a very it's very quiet and meditative and um, it, it needed at least me how old could I have been when I heard it eleven or twelve maybe and it mm -hmm. took a couple of listens I remember and then all of a sudden one day. I realized that it was as grand and beautiful of an album as old things must pass in many ways, right down to the packaging, um, the whole presentation of the album. Um, 
uh, I, I love. And to me, it's almost like a 1B to 33 and a third. And right behind those is George Harrison. Um, another album that I think a lot of George fans have rediscovered it over the past 20 plus years. An album that you might have at first, maybe it got past you because a lot of George's stuff is like that. It's very, it's very light. It, if you're not like paying close attention, it goes past you. Mm. But, um, and also because it tended to be a very laid back album. As I got older, I understood what was going on there. George had just become a father. He had just married for the second time. There was a very much a sense of domesticity in the material, which explains probably why it was called George Harrison, why it was such a um, mellower album, more reflective on family and values, you know, life values. Um, so that grew in stature in my book. And um, I feel compelled to pick fourth to pick Cloud Nine. I love Cloud Nine. Loved it when it first came out. There's two songs on side two of the album that kind of like ruined the album for me a bit. Um, Breath Away from Heaven. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's the other movie song that he includes. Someplace uh, Else? Yeah, thank you. I can never remember both the titles. To me, mm -hmm. it seemed as though he put those on there because he wanted to kind of expose those movie tracks. Are they both from Shanghai Surprise? Are they both from Shanghai Surprise? Those songs? Someplace they Else and Breath Away from Heaven, yes. I almost But they're different recordings than the ones that were in the movie. And the movie came out around what year? Because I've never seen... I've never I think seen it was eight, oh geez, 86 or 87. Cloud was... 9 was 87. It was close in time. I always felt that George put those on there. He, he had a a purpose of putting those movie songs on that album because I don't think the the film didn't do that well. I remember the reviews no, didn't. Were, not, were not good. <laughs> they really uh, slammed it. And George, it was like George's review of it wasn't that good. He said it's really hard <laughs> making a comedy with actors who have no sense of humor. <laughs> Speaking of Madonna, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. They don't fit on Cloud Nine. Those two songs. Oh, and, I don't agree with you. <laughs> you know? Okay, no. that's fine. Um. <laughs> The other thing with Cloud Nine, which is not the album's fault, and it's not the fault really of the fact that it was at that point a little overexposed with Traveling Wilburys and with the Jeff Lynne sound, which I adored, uh, and the Tom Petty Full Moon Fever album, to the point where I find I don't go listen to Cloud Nine as much, even though it's so loaded with great George Harrison songs on there hmm. uh, and deserved every bit of you know, commercial success it enjoyed. I still don't know how it did not end up as a number one album in the U.S. I'm always surprised when I go check and I was like, because I'd forget and go, wait a minute, Cloud9 wasn't number one? How is that possible? I mean, just alone at being amongst that Jeff, when Jeff Lynn all of a sudden was everywhere. Right. You know? um, uh, but Cloud9, I feel compelled to put on there because maybe being a bit tired of it is not a reason for me to leave it off because I do think very highly of the album. And I close out my list. This was tough. There's um, it was a toss up, a coin flip. Um, it's either gone Trapo or dark horse hmm. at the bottom of my list. And I can never really kind of separate them. And I know that as the years went past, as I grew up, I used to love somewhere in England and that would have been on my list. If we did this show, 30 years ago, say somewhere in England would have been on there and dark horse would have been higher up, but they kind of dropped a bit. And I realized that gone Trapa was a missed opportunity for me as a George Harrison fan, because I didn't buy it till many years later as an afterthought hmm. uh, because I didn't have it. And I bought it because I didn't have it. That was it. And I remember listening to it going is not really all that much different about this than what he was doing at that time. And therefore, I mean, you couldn't even, it, it, it didn't, couldn't even get, <laughs> what was the expression? It didn't, couldn't even get itself arrested when it came out. Right. 
you know, which made absolutely no sense to me. So, and even recently I posted something about it when we passed the anniversary last year of its release. And a few people have commented on Facebook on my post. Well, like, you know, that was really, really one bad album. And I'm like, no, it wasn't. You know, in fact, George technically, I don't think has made a bad album. No, you know, it's I an extra texture to me because something has to drop to the bottom. Might have been a little uninspired, and maybe that would fall to my the bottom of my list. But John Trapo definitely is not a bad album. Yeah, you take, take that Rolling <laughs> Stone. <laughs> yeah, and then then when I saw that, I'm like, come on, how? I mean, you could try hard if you have to. St- Pick electronic sound because it's obvious. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to, or just don't go there. I mean, that whole list. Don't get me started with that Rolling Stone list. That whole list was had things on there that shouldn't have been there, or should have been lower or higher. Or, you know, I love Emerson, Lake and Palmer, but how do they put a list out like that and not include the album Love Beach? <laughs> yeah. You know, how is that not on the, that list? And yet, there's other things I'm looking at going. Why is this on the list? And why is it this high? And Gon Trapo was one. I was like, you know what? I really, really should throw this in the fireplace. Well, but I did those lists I was are... reading it on my computer. And if I would have done that, that would have been a problem. But uh, if I had the physical paper magazine, I would have maybe thrown it in the fireplace. Some of those lists are a waste of time. And that's, I was kind of I was kind of waiting for some time in New York City to be in there since that's the one that everybody roasts yeah, of true. John. So, and and then of all things, two virgins. I'm like, why? Bo- why even bother? Hmm. It's why quick. would you put that in the same category as a pop rock album anyway? Why? I mean, you know, that's stupid. I don't even remember what was number. Do we remember what? Do we care what number one was on their list? I don't even remember. I don't remember either. <laughs> Anyway, anywho, those are my albums. Your tastes are too much like mine, Darren. This is getting to be dangerous. Anyway, (laughs) Alan, how about you? Okay, Um, I think for me, you know, if we're not counting all things must pass, my top one would have to be Cloud Nine. Um, There's something about that album that you know, after after waiting. You know, I, I I say so many years. It seemed like so many years at the time, but it's like what five, five, six. Yeah, it wasn't that long. Now that you look back, um, you know, for a, for a new George album, and then it then it was that. And to mm. me, there aren't any bad songs on that. In fact, I didn't include any obscurities from it because to me, there aren't any obscurities from it. I listened to that album so much when it came out that, and and there were a bunch of singles from it um that i i just i just didn't think that anything on it was fair game for that list um to me it's about as perfect as all things must pass and okay maybe not up there i mean if we are including all things must pass that still has to go above cloud nine but but then cloud nine um because it and it was you know a kind of rebirth for george and like with the i was saying about the japan tour you know sort of was hoping that he would uh you know sort of off the success of it would just continue um and didn't really um Let's see what would I, you know, like, like Darren said, he didn't do any bad albums. And so this was really kind of difficult. Um, so I'm going to put brainwashed up there as well, just because I like all the songs on it. I I think that it wasn't really necessarily what he was planning as an album. I, my, my impression sort of is that he was recording a lot of stuff that he wasn't putting out and between instructions he left and things that Danny felt himself that that became the brainwashed album um but if he wasn't dying it might have been a totally different album you know it, it might have I, I think mm. he probably had a lot of stuff and um but you know everything on it I, I really like and especially any road you know I I, uh-huh. I, I really like that song I, I think that's one of his best um i i love the the couplet you know if you don't know where you're going any road will take you there that's that's brilliant mm. like mm. sort of like why didn't he think of that earlier you know 
Um, let's see. Um, and I'm going to choose Gontrapo third, just to tell Rolling Stone what I think of their um, choice. Uh, I've always liked that album from the time I got it. I mean, I, I remember finding it in a record store. It must have been like right when it came out and thinking what... I haven't heard anything about this. What's yeah. what is this? You know, mm. um, and it was it was new, and I took it home. Really enjoyed it. He did no publicity for it. Right. You know, it, it it's just as if it's just as if he released that album in secret. Mm. You know, um, it takes a lot of um, crap. Uh, you know, people. Often, you know, Rolling Stone isn't alone in saying it's not a good album or it's his worst album or whatever. But, you know, I, I find I find a lot of it um, sort of humorous and fun and upbeat, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's like, uh, what, three so uh, the rest of them is is it's kind of hard, you know. I got uh, I I guess George Harrison has to come next for uh, the mushrooms. <laughs> no, and everything else on that album, it's it's a very <laughs> enjoyable album too. Um, and also in that case, you know, sometimes we like albums for sort of extra musical reasons, you know. Um, in that case, I remember, you know, he, he did a lot of publicity about that. He did some long interviews where he went track by track and explained everything. And, and I still remember those. And, um, and I found that sort of a, a really good kind of intro to that album. It might've been, um, rock line or something. One of those, one of those radio shows where, you know, they play the track and then he will talk about what mm -hmm. it is, um, and so I got one more, right? And that's really hard. And I know I know one that Ken is going to have, and I'll leave that totally to him, but it's a really great album. Um, and I'll go- You can with... include it. You can include it too. Well, I think our listeners should have as much variety as possible. So I'm going to go with Somewhere in England. Um, I might actually, however, go with the unreleased original version of Somewhere in England okay. because- I thought that was a, a really, you know, well, I can't say I thought it at the time because we didn't have it until it subsequently came out as a bootleg. Um, hearing it as a bootleg, I, I thought that was a really fine album. And I don't understand really why Warner gave him so much trouble about it. Um, but then in the, you know, the second version of the album that actually came out, there was, as Ken pointed out, Blood from a Clone. Blood from a Clone... You know, it isn't one of my favorite George Harrison songs. I, I'm not that crazy about the song itself. I like the attitude of the song, mm. which is basically to tell Warner what he thinks about them having rejected the album originally when they're just sort of, you know, putting out, you know, a lot of mechanistic crap. And that was his comment on it. I like the fact that he commented on it. I wish I liked the song more than I do. I don't hate the song. But, you know, it never went in. Every time we do one of these lists, I listen to it, hoping I can include it, and it never quite makes the cut. But I like the attitude of it. Um, and so so there's that. My Somewhere in England is sort of a, a double album or an album and a half or something like that, because I, I, I'd go with the original. But I like what he did in response to it being rejected by his label. So that's okay. Great. All and right. Too. <laughs> I meant to ask Darren. I mean, you 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 said thirty three and a third was number one if you don't count mm -hmm. all things was mm -hmm. best, but didn't really go into detail about thirty three and a third. You said pound for pound. You know, yeah, it, I, I, I I love every single song I did. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It just to me it was flawless. You know, mm -hmm. the whole experience. See, I always harp on this. I always feel like um, when you're at an impressionable age, um, and and I'm sure for many it's when you're young, when you're at an impressionable age, the impact that, whether it be music or, or a, a sport or a particular game you've seen or um, whatever, when you're at an impressionable age, 
the, the thing that happens at that time it always remains this kind of this, this uh, wonderful experience that you had. Am I making sense? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and it, for me, and it, it stays a, with you. It stays with you. That yeah. Experience. I mean, thirty three and a third came out at a time when I tie all these loose ends together. Uh, George showing up on Saturday Night Live and mm -hmm. watching Saturday Night Live on Saturdays. And Saturdays was my uh, kind of like my album listening day because there was no school on Saturday, you know. And uh, during Monday through Friday, half the day was spent in the classroom. Then you come home, you do your homework. And then, you know, I lived, I was an only child who lived in a three room apartment in the Bronx. And you know, you couldn't, you didn't have the kind of freedom where I could go to my room and listen to records at 11 o'clock at night because it was like, you know, three rooms. Hmm. And my parents were there. I couldn't stop firing up my, you know, so it was almost like my lifestyle growing up. A lot of the music that I, that I had when I was growing up was listened to on Friday nights, Saturdays, especially. And Saturday just became a thing. And I, you know, 33 and the third, George was on Saturday Night Live. Uh, the videos were Cracker Box Palace. And I, I think both Cracker Box Palace and this song were played song. on Saturday yep. Night Live. All helping to reinforce that that album was a, a, a very important album for me. Um, and just, you know, Beautiful Girl is perfect. His version, because it was a cover, we didn't mention it in the show. That true his version of true love should have also been a big hit song. Yes. You I know, agree. in much the same way that Ringo was having hits with covers a couple of years earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, true love is a George Harrison song. It's so good mm -hmm. the way he does it. Um, so you know, I, I mean that and it was my first. You remember your first. <laughs> and, and and that's where George Harrison, that's a 33 and the third. You know, and, and then the same thing with George Harrison. You know, when that came out, it came out around the time I came out around this time of the year, I think. And, you know, my birthday's in March. So I believe it was a gift. A friend of mine bought it for me and it just kind of resonated for whatever reason things resonate. Mm. And um, and I always did look at all things must pass as being brilliant. Uh, but, I, you know, like I said before, Apple Jam would then roll around. And I felt like that was part of the All Things Must Pass listening experience. And the fact that nine times out of 10, I won't play it. I wouldn't play it. The third record meant I wasn't listening to the full album. Therefore, comma, 33 and a third, you know, would always rise to the top of my list. But I'm not okay. going to do that anymore because I'm tired of being called an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just think that, you know, if you love the two albums on All Things Must Pass, most people aren't going to listen to an album of just jams, all instrumentals, you know, even despite the star-studded cast that he had on there. Um, but, you know, I always looked at it as just something but, uh, that's a bonus in addition to two albums of fantastic material. But um, if you've got songs that still resonate with you oh. and you've got incredible memories attached to them, that's something that's really powerful. So right. that's part of the reason why 33 and a third and George Harrison, why you connect on those. You know what Dark right. Horse should do? What's they, that? They, what Dark Horse should do is they should put together a compilation um, provisionally called George Harrison Tells Them What For. <laughs> And start with, you know, if you look at through his his catalog and, I, you know, I don't have the whole the whole catalog list in front of me. So, I, you know, there's other ones I'm not thinking of, but start with, you know, Not Guilty, Blood from a Clone, this song, Devil's Radio, even Isn't It a Pity, you know, is basically George reacting to people who have somehow... Uh, I don't it's too strong to say offended him but you know i mean not guilty is is obvious and blood from a clone we just talked about and and this song is a response to the lawsuit you know um <clears throat> devil's Rain. under the mill 
run of the mill. Yeah. Yeah. And and I kind of think that if we were to um, sit down, you know, now with the complete listing of all his albums, we would definitely be able to find um, a, a disc's worth of that kind of song i mean you can even probably put i don't care anymore in there as <laughs> is the end that can mm. be the last track <laughs> anyway i like it yeah it just sort of uh it, it when when darren was talking about 33 and a third and i was i was thinking about you know the, this song promo um it, it sort of occurred to me that he does have all these songs where he's basically giving you what for you know i mean mm. So it's sort of a, yeah, um, <laughs> we should come up with our playlist like we just did, but add some more to it. Mm-hmm. All right. My top five albums, you know, when you're talking about, you know, all the way up there, one, two, three, it's kind of easy, but as Darren has said a number of times, I really think his, his catalog is so consistently strong. Um, debatable whether or not it's the most consistently strong of all all four Beatles but um you know even the lesser albums is so much material that I do like on them but um I put at number five these are all the ones except for all things must pass I put brainwash on there the most important thing to me is how strong the songs are and song for song I love everything on brainwashed um I like the less produced feel that it was given uh, and that doesn't mean that i don't like the way cloud nine was produced because part of the reason for the success of cloud nine is because of jeff lynn's production and jeff also helped out george songwriting wise on a few of the songs but brainwashed i liked a lot because there's so many great songs on there like you said any road alan what a great song i don't i don't know why that wouldn't have been a huge hit but you know without going into my tirade about radio and whether or not top 40 radio or singles radio would even play a veteran artist which they wouldn't um you know any road in the early 70s would have been a major hit um such a great song right there the only problem i've ever had with brainwash but it also makes me find the album even more interesting is that it's it is kind of as alan said it's kind of like uh an album where it's um you know it's it spans a lot of years because any road itself was actually written when george was making the video for this is love so you're talking about 1988 I think the year was for that stuck inside a cloud. I know was an older song uh, between the devil and the deep blue sea was taken from when he was on Jules Holland's TV show uh, run so far was a song that he gave to Eric Clapton for his journeyman album, but this is George's version of the song. So there's songs that are spread out from the eighties and possibly even the seventies, because I still have to find out for sure. I know I heard Jim Keltner, say that he heard stuck inside a cloud sometime like in between 33 and a third george harris and that time but as for when the songs were recorded by george that could have been much much later in the 90s or closer to his to his passing but the songs on on brainwashed are outstanding marwa blues what an amazing instrumental and great sly guitar work on there it's like you're reaching for the sky or reaching for the sun you get that feeling when you hear something like that pisces fish has a real folk sound to it almost very (laughs) dylan-esque rising sun i think is an outstanding song stuck inside a cloud there's so much great stuff on there um you know i wish we didn't have to wait so long between cloud nine and brainwashed but i'm sure grateful that george um recorded the tracks that he did and that that jeff lynn and danny finished them up um yeah a solid album all the way through uh p2 vatican blues last saturday night what a great song to follow any road um just love the whole thing um i also had to put cloud nine in there and um cloud nine is an album that i never get tired of hearing and i know what what darren was saying about you know jeff lynn's production and the the fact that it got played so much you kind of get tired of it i'm still not tired of it I still love hearing Full Moon Fever and Mystery Girl from Roy Orbison and 
the traveling Willowbury stuff. I like that sound. I think it added a lot to the songs and, um, you know, Jeff helping to write songs like that's what it takes. And um, this is love. And when he was fab, he was a really good collaborator for George. I think George needed a little push from somebody else. He, he even said that um, he didn't want the whole burden of production to be on himself. So Jeff Lynn was really, you know, I think the perfect solution in that regard where George is concerned. I love the title track to Cloud Nine. I've often said it's very tough when it comes to a one-two punch, two songs together. Like I mentioned, Dark Sweet Lady and, and Your Love Is Forever. Two great love songs back to back. To me, it's real tough to top that's what it takes going into fish on the sand. I can't listen to one song without going to the next one. And um, fish on the sand is an outstanding song. It really does have like a country and Western rockabilly feel to it. This is love is so beatly. It screams Beatles. And I love it. When it was fab, I love a lot. Devil's radio is a great rocker. Unlike you, Darren, I don't, I'm not at all disappointed with Breath Away from Heaven. When George does something that's different, in this case, like, uh, you know, an oriental feel, um, I consider that refreshing. You know, something, you know, you were talking about Gontrapo in a way where maybe it hurt the album that George didn't do anything that different. Is it that much different? Is Gontrapo that much different than the George Harrison album? I don't think so, really. But I think Gontrapo has got strong songs on it, which is the, the single most important thing in the world to me. Um, I love Got My Mind Set on You. Wreck of the Hesperus is an excellent, good, funky cut right there. Someplace Else fits along with a lot of great George Harrison ballads. It's a solid album all the way through. And I will agree, I don't know why that album didn't go all the way to number one, but it was a big comeback for him. And I'm happy for all the success that he had from Cloud9. Um, I also have to put 33 and a third in there. 33 and a third and the George Harrison album are two killer albums back to back. It's really hard to top the two. Although here I just mentioned Cloud9 and Brainwashed. But there was a huge gap in between the two. There is a 15 year gap between Cloud9 and Brainwashed. But uh, 33 and a third. Same thing, solid all the way through. What a great opening cut, woman, woman, don't you cry for me. Um, I love Dear One, the spiritual side of George there, Beautiful Girl, all those songs. I like the, the humorous side of George with this song in Cracker Box Palace. Um, it's really hard for me to think of those two songs without thinking of the two great videos that George made for it. And yes, like you, Darren, when I think about 33 and a third, I always think about Saturday Night Live. How can you not? I mean, I'm a big fan of that show in all these years, and we all have our favorite cast and everything. But I think for a lot of us who grew up with the show, the early cast that they had the first five years was really special for them. And the fact that, you know, George Harrison appeared on the show with Paul Simon. I mean, two icons two of my favorite people in music singing together. And then George there in the opening sketch with Lord Michaels and, uh, and showing the two videos. It, it's my favorite episode ever of Saturday night live and Paul Simon coming out in the Turkey outfit, <laughs> which was so funny. Um, yeah. 33 and a third is, a, is an amazing album. And like you, Darren learning how to love you. If I had to pick my top three love songs, George Harrison solo career, they would have to be. That is all. Your love is forever. Learning how to love you. Learning how to love you has a nice light jazz feel, which is something that I brought up here on this show for many years. Around the time of Dark Horse, when George was working with LA Express on a few songs on there, when you're talking about certain songs like especially Far East Man, which has that real, it has jazz overtones to it um and the same thing is carried over into 33 and a third with learning how to love you and pure smoky those songs um i love the fact that tom scott was involved with 33 and a third um and just all the way through outstanding one song after another 
And then I have to include the George Harrison album for the same reason. George Harrison album is, is like an album where for me, he's really comfortable just being himself. And I don't think it mattered that much to him at that point in his career, whether it was a number one album or a top 20 album. It didn't really matter. What mattered that it was that he was pleased with the end result. And he did have a top 20 hit with Blow Away, which I think is a great single from the album. But all the songs are solid. I love it all the way through. Um, love Comes to Everyone is a great opening cut and a great message to share with the world that we all can find love at some point in our lives. Um, I love faster, you know, it, it's all so well constructed songs all the way through. And the guitar work is fantastic. As you said, if you believe, which he co-wrote with Gary, Wright, That could have been a single, you know, I don't know why that wasn't a follow-up to, to, to blow away. Or like I've said so many times, if it was a single in the early seventies, it would have been uh, a hit. Uh, more of a hit but um everything here comes the moon you know what a great you know answer song from here comes the sun it's just so well produced and uh great songs all the way through george harrison and 33 and a third it, it's very tough you know uh i think we did a show on talk more talk best one two punches <laughs> you know when it came to albums and you can easily go with you know band on the run venus and mars that kind of thing but definitely uh for me 33 and a third and george harrison mm -hmm. and my favorite i haven't mentioned my favorite but everybody should know because i've said it more than anything else is living in the material world yeah. because I was fact, to be here be here now is your one of the songs in your list that was your wedding um, song, was it not? No, it was not. That is all was a wedding song. That is all was a wedding song. Okay. I had uh, a wedding song, one from each Beatle. You know, so that is all was the one for from George. Okay. I don't know what made me think it was Be Here Now. But anyway, that's... Okay. I remember, you know. Anyway. But I just love living in the material world because I just think that it's George at his most personal. I love the spiritual side of him. I think he explains himself really, really well to the world. As I said earlier, with with um, the light that has lighted the world and who can see it, give me love, give me peace on earth, I think, is has really risen. I've heard that song so much more now, you know, than, than I have in, in the past, you know, aside from when it was a hit. Um, I think that song is appreciated a lot more now. The only problem I have with the album for someone like me who thinks it's the greatest album in the world, the average person out there only knows Give Me Love. <laughs> and all the other songs are just amazing to me. Don't Let Me Wait Too Long is a very commercial song, which really should have been the second single. I love the title track on there. Ringo doing a very short drum solo being mentioned in the song. The Lord, the Lord Loves the One. Such incredible slide guitar work. I know I say that a lot, but I love the slide guitar work on that song. Um, and Be Here Now, I think, is is a masterpiece. As I said earlier, you know, George doesn't mind writing and recording very slow songs. You don't get much slower than Be Here Now. And when you've got one word taking up a measure in the song, remember, two, three, four, now. <laughs> you know he's really driving home the message of of that song and um it is very much like a mantra uh the day the world gets round is an amazing song in its message try some buy some which is left over from um you know the recordings of ronnie specter doing that song um and that is all which is to me you know his greatest love song in his solo career um helped to make that uh, my favorite album from him very often i've said to me living in the material world really carries over what all things must pass did without the phil specter production and i have nothing against phil specter's production because i loved what he did on all things must pass but if you want one that's more simple and stripped down living in the material world is more to your liking although try some by some was co-produced by phil specter but um if you care about songs 
And many of his songs have a message. They certainly did on All Things Must Pass. But something that is even more deeply personal of George telling to the world how he feels at that point in his life. You can't top the light that has lighted the world who can see it and be here now, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that's my favorite album from George and my favorite album of all time from anybody. And then I would say, under normal circumstances here, all things must pass would be number two when it comes to George, but we're not including all things must pass. So it would be two for you. It would be two, but for me putting you know, 33 and a third ahead of all things must pass is fine. Sure. It's allowed. <laughs> All right. So that's our list. What are you guys watching? Think. Let us know your thoughts. Give us your top five solo George albums, other than All Things Must Pass. Your top five solo George songs that he wrote or co wrote that are more of the obscure ones that you think really the world should know. Really deserve notice and recognition. Let us know. Okay, so um, why don't we go around and tell folks what we've been doing on our own. How about Mr. 39th Anniversary first with Darren? What have I been doing on my own? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, if you want to uh, listen, and why would you not want to? Don't answer that. Uh, you want to check me out on FUV Monday through Thursday nights, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m., and Saturdays from 1 to 4 in the afternoon. If you're in the New York City Tri-State area, 90.7 FM. Or you can listen anywhere at WFUV.org or get our app. And um, you can email me directly. Actually, you know what? Better than the emailing. Come to Facebook or go to Facebook. I have two Facebook pages. Uh, shoot me a friend request or, or follow the other one. And I'll get you on the other one and we'll be connected that way. So that's the way to go. Very good, sir. Alan? You know, all of our information is in the uh, episode description on uh, YouTube and Podbeam. You um, can reach me most easily through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, there is also a page for uh, the McCartney Legacy, and there is a web page for McCartney Legacy, McCartneyLegacy.com. Um, we've also just started a YouTube page. Uh, look it up on YouTube. It's uh, McCartney Legacy. And uh, we're putting some uh, unusual things that we found in the course of researching this. For instance, I think the first thing that Adrian put up was um, the French broadcast that is yep. sampled in um, uh, Picasso's Picasso last words. words. Yeah. Uh, we have sort of the whole French thing that it came from. Um, wow. and we'll be putting up some other sort of obscurities as it didn't. It's, I don't think it could clearly stated in the d description. What was that? That that French, yeah, it was a uh, it was a I think a, a BBC French language radio broadcast, um, basically for French tourists in Britain, okay, Thanks. and it was it's a I, when I was younger, I used to wonder if that was a recording of Picasso speaking. No, no, no. Um, uh, and anyway, otherwise, I mean, what what I've been up to is basically writing uh, volume two. Um, we're both sort of uh, involved in that. And there are, you know, so far, I'm only into the beginning in 1975. They're starting work on well, they've already started work on Venus and Mars. They're sort of now picking it up again in New Orleans. Um, but there are already um, a number of surprises. I think things that uh, that people won't have known about before, and that's only in in the first five chapters. Uh, I'm on chapter six right now, so this sort of occupies uh, most of my days and nights at the moment. And um, yeah, that's that. Okay. Very cool YouTube page for the McCartney Legacy. I'll have to check that out. 
And if you want to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have a Facebook page, Ken Michaels. It's a photo of me with uh, my late dog, who I named Nilsson for Harry Nilsson. Um, you can friend me on there. Uh, on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio, just want to mention a few shows that I did recently. One was with the author Colin Hall, who just put out a book, The Songs the Beatles Gave Away. This is an amazing book. It tells you about the songs that the Beatles gave to artists while the Beatles were a band. So all the other stuff to follow during the solo careers are not mentioned in here. Takes you into like 1970, Doris Troy, I think it ends with. But um, the great thing about this particular book is that it talks about the early years of Lennon and McCartney. What were the first songs that they wrote? And uh, when they started giving songs to other artists, how that whole thing was developed. But for every single artist that's mentioned in here, if Colin has the information, it gives you history about each one of them. And also what happened after they had their success or after they recorded a song that John and Paul, in most cases here, it's Lennon McCartney songs that that uh, that they gave to them. Fantastic book. Um, the interview with Colin, God bless him, it was over three hours long. It felt like an hour to me. So for any of you who have watched this interview, especially all the way through, God bless you. <laughs> but uh, you'll learn a lot about many of the artists, um, artists who were signed to Apple. The story of Mortimer is very interesting. But uh, Colin Hall, that's the name of his book. I also did an interview with Kenny Forgione, who's the founding member of a Long Island band called wondrous stories and they're named after the yes song um they are basically a progressive and classic rock tribute band and every year they put on a show called uh the concert for bangladesh revisited you might have heard me talk about this on this podcast show and my other podcast show talk more talk they recreate the entire concert for bangladesh it's one of the most amazing shows you'll ever see they just did it uh, the day before George's birthday on Long Island. They do it once a year. So Kenny talks about uh, the origins of Wondrous Stories and how that whole thing started. And every year they have special guests on stage to join them. They've had Denny Lane. They've had Steve Holly. They've had Gene Cornish from the Rascals, all kinds of people who join them on stage. And so that's on there. And I also did my first ever all trivia, Beatles trivia show with the Talk More Talk gang on there and um you know it all centers on games and trivia questions that you'll find that i've been doing on the radio since i started almost 41 years ago and also on my website kenmichaelsradio.com talk more talk my other uh talk show podcast we just did a tribute show as we did here on things we said today for yoko ono that's another one with madeline Bacaro. what a fantastic guest she is author of that new book on Yoko Ono, In Your Mind. And we're going to be doing a show on George Harrison as well. Can't ignore the would-be 80th birthday. Um, my show, Every Little Thing, my syndicated radio show, just want to mention you can always listen to it online because it's on demand at WFDU's website, WFDU.FM. Um, after they air the show on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Eastern, they post it and make it available for two weeks. So you actually have two shows there available at any given time. Each one is available for two weeks. As one is taken off, they put a new one up. And um, I do believe that's everything. I did appear on Scott O'Rourke's Beatles show. He does a Beatles show at the University of Stony Brook. His show called With the Beatles, and he did a three-hour George Harrison tribute, and I appeared on the show as a guest while I was on Long Island for the concert for Bangladesh Revisited to see that. We talked a lot about that show, and that's available at um, their website as an archived show. You have to go to WUSB um, FM and look up their archive shows there. And I think that's everything. All right. God bless you, George. Happy 80th birthday. Thank you for all the great music. And uh, we all know you live on in all of us. Thanks to all of you for watching. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Later.